So based on their current NOI, a quarter of all the properties that have maturing debt this year, it will not qualify due to not enough income, right? Because what that means right now is as interest rates have gone up, a lot of the way that these lenders look at a refinance is they have to normalize the debt payments to what income they're generating, right? And so because interest rates are so high, the debt payments are higher, which means you can only put out so much debt against a property. And right now, most a lot of these properties could not support a new loan at the current interest rates. What's going on, Freedom Investors? This is John Pearl. In today's show, I had the absolute pleasure of speaking with Ben Frazier, who is the Chief Investment Officer at Aspen Funds and co-host of the Invest Like a Billionaire podcast. In today's show, we dove deep into the macro space, how we got to where we are, what's going on today, and what we're looking like in the years to come. We also dove into the multifamily and industrial space, as well as oil and gas. Why should we invest in oil and gas? My favorite part of the show was one of the last questions we got to. What are some of the top lessons he's learned hosting the Invest Like a Billionaire podcast? I really enjoyed today's discussion with Ben, and I hope you do as well. Ben, welcome to the show. How are you doing today, my man? Hey, doing awesome. Looking forward to chatting. Excellent. All right, Ben, I thought a good place to start would be kind of painting the picture from a, a macro standpoint. The Fed just had their meeting. I do understand the interest rates are going to stay the same. Paint the picture. Uh, where are we at? How do we get here? What can we kind of expect to see this year? Yeah, sure. So, you know, for those that don't know much about me or Aspen Funds, um, you know, we're a fund manager in kind of the real estate and alternative investment space. And we pay a lot of attention to the macro um, and the macro for us really drives a lot of our investment themes and really where we decide to stick the fork in and where we want to invest. And so we're looking, um, you know, at a lot of different things going on and trying to understand the landscape. And our perspective is there's always an area to win in, right? Even when there's challenges in the economy, even when there's you know certain parts of the economy that aren't doing well. There's opportunities, and as investors, we need to be trained to look for them and think um, uh, that way. And a lot of times, you know, if you're looking for that, you'll you'll see opportunities before some others do. And it's just it's so helpful to understand these kind of big picture trends going on to know how to position yourself as an investor to take advantage of it. Right. So that's a little diatribe on why it matters, but. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things going on, right? There's, if you take a, a, a step back and you look over the past 18 months, um, we're in a totally different world than we were 18 months ago, right? And we've seen interest rates increase at the fastest rate in history in the US. And that has put a um, enormous amount of pressure in multiple sectors of the economy, you know, foremost being real estate and commercial real estate. And the market really hasn't had time to digest a lot of what's going on. And so, you know, from our perspective, the real simple, you know, big things that happened were, you know, COVID happened. Um, we have huge spike in unemployment. The uh, uh, you know, government decides to send an enormous amount of money directly to individuals, as well as pump money into the economy through PPP loans and other vehicles. So we had an enormous amount of cash that was kind of injected into the economy. And it took some time for that to kind of make its way through. What that's done is cause inflation to kind of hit. And then as a result, the Fed is trying to temper inflation uh, by raising interest rates. And so we're kind of at this point now where we're at, um, we're not all time high interest rates, but we're at the highest we've seen in many, many decades. And for those of us that are maybe younger, like you and I, and some of the listeners here, this is new territory and we don't really know what to expect, what to look for, how is it this kind of, you know, make its you know, trickle effect through the economy. And, you know, the, you know, what we've been saying for a little while on our podcast, and we talk a lot about macro is we believe inflation is going to be higher for longer. And we were saying that before, you know, that was kind of the, the more consensus or thought around it. But what that means likely is that if inflation is higher for longer, interest rates are likely going to be higher for longer. And again, the market has slowly started to digest that, but I still think the market is still pretty aggressive in the rate cuts that they're expecting for this year. I've heard you know, another senior economist say that he could expect up to like five or six interest rate cuts this year, just in 2024, um, 
you know, I'm not, uh, you know, Nostradamus, you know, I have my thoughts. I could be totally wrong, but I think that's still pretty aggressive. And so as we sit today, we're in this really unique time frame where last year, a lot of people were concerned about recession. We've been saying we're not going to see recession because the consumer is very, very strong, still very, very healthy from an amount of cash that they have, real rate wage growth, you know, debt service relative to income is still very low. Uh, we have a very, very strong job market, which um, you know, drives that wage growth and a pretty strong economy. We saw consumer spending, the Q4 numbers just came out uh, as we're talking today, and uh, really, really strong spending, right? And, and so much of the economy, roughly 70% of the GDP is driven by consumer spending. So a strong consumer means a strong economy. And so we're in this kind of tale of two worlds. There's all these tensions. There's all this stress in the system, but it's still being managed, um, you know, to a certain degree. And so, you know, our perspective is we're going to kind of be in this, what I'll call muddle through economy for probably the next 18 to 24 months, unless something breaks and it gets a little bit worse. But, you know, that that's kind of where we stand right now. Got it. So. We've painted the picture a little bit, what's going on with the economy. So a couple of years ago, a lot of deals were purchased towards the end of 2021, going into 2022. Those deals are struggling now, a lot of them at least with foreclosures are starting to happen, short-term bridge loans with adjustable rates are maturing, but there's so much money on the sidelines. I think a lot of people are expecting a dip. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's going to be pretty wild, I think, honestly. And I think in some ways where we're seeing this kind of tale of two worlds in the broader economy, I think we're going to see a lot of deals that hold strong and then a lot of stress that, you know, a lot of big challenges in the multifamily space. And so, you know, we, we've been multifamily investors for a while. Um, we only did two deals last year, you know, and that's, you know, probably what a lot of people did or did did none. Um, and for us, the real opportunities were finding uh, these assumable loans that had you know agency debt with really low interest rates we could assume, and then complete a business plan um, with the really nice fixed rate low debt. Um, but those are very hard to to find, and you're going to pay a premium for them, right? So it's not always worth it. But at a larger scale, what we're really kind of seeing, and we're actually kind of shifting our approach this year. Um, I'll explain that in a minute, but where I think you know the, the the big picture is, if you look at some of the data, we have um, several factors that are putting a lot of stress on multifamily um, properties and operators right now. One is, you know, uh, in the kind of post-COVID era, right out the gate, we had amazing rental growth, right? We had a ton of rental demand, so we're seeing top line revenue uh, just grow in numbers we hadn't seen in a long, long time. In some markets, double-digit rent growth, right, which is kind of unheard of in in rental real estate, and so it created a lot of demand, a lot of investors trying to jump in, and that is kind of flipped pretty hard, right? We're not seeing the same level of rent growth. In fact, most markets are seeing you know either same level rents or lower rents, rent deceleration. So we're having top line revenue going down. Meanwhile, you know insurance costs are lagging, you know. Uh, indicator of you know the the top line growth and so we're seeing insurance <clears throat> costs massively rise <clears throat> we're also seeing property taxes you know come in you know with big reassessments as values have gone up we're seeing this labor in general so we're seeing all these operating costs continue to increase right so you have uh lower revenue higher expenses so that means lower noi and then to the extent that you had floating rate debt your interest carry is uh, your interest carry cost, meaning just the amount of uh, interest you got to pay to service your debt if it was floating rate is, is gone up uh, massively. And so you have these three factors that are putting a ton of pressure all in the wrong direction on these properties. And so it's, it's, it's going to cause a lot of stress. It's not going to be across the board, right? Because if you have fixed rate debt, you know, you could probably manage it. And I also think there's different um, parts of the rental real estate spectrum that are going to probably perform better than others. We've been moving up the kind of quality spectrum, you know, last year going only kind of class A or B plus assets where we think inflation is going to impact the tenants less, right? Because they have more ability to earn more wages. 
And so I think the kind of class C lower end properties are going to probably be hit the hardest. Um, and so if you look at some of the reports being sent out by some of these big brokers and um, just data firms like Newmark, um, they put out some amazing content recently. I would Google uh, Newmark's research, uh, capital markets reports and multifamily reports. They're estimating somewhere to the tune of 25 plus percent of properties that have maturing debt this year will not qualify for a refinance, right? So based on their current NOI, a quarter of all the properties that have maturing debt this year, and it's, it's probably more than that, honestly, that this is just CMBS data because that's you know public information, um, is will not qualify due to not enough income, right? Because what that means right now is as interest rates have gone up, a lot of the way that these lenders look at a refinance is they have to um, kind of normalize the debt payments to what income they're generating, right? And so because interest rates are so high, the debt payments are higher, which means you can only put out so much debt against a property. And right now, most a lot of these properties are not, could not support a new loan um, at the current interest rates. And so what that's going to do is, is I think the first step is a lot of lenders are going to kick the can down the road, right? They're just going to say, oh, we'll just extend and pretend it's not an issue. But at a certain point, if interest rates don't dramatically decline, which I don't think they're going to, um, they're going to have to deal with it. And like you said, we're already starting to see foreclosures pop. We're already starting to see um, you know, a lot of these uh, loans kind of get risk rate higher. A lot of these CLOs are like collateralized pools of loans that are publicly traded are being massively uh, uh, priced down. And so we're starting to see the beginning of what I think is going to be some pretty severe stress, but I think it's going to be pockets of it, right? I don't think it's going to be the next great financial crisis where the whole system collapses because that was really a banking crisis. And this may impact certain banks that have heavy allocations into commercial real estate and say office or some you know, part of the commercial real estate sector that's um, going to be hit harder than others. But it's it's going to be more idiosyncratic versus systemic, uh, in my opinion. Let's talk a little bit about the supply and demand side of multifamily over, say, the next five to ten years. You know, currently, currently it's crazy. There's lots of homeowners with very low interest rates locked in for a long time. Very little single family for sale. Big delta between cost to rent versus mortgage payments. How do you kind of see this playing out from that side of the house? Yeah, so the residential market, you know, if you're looking at single family homes versus multifamily, you know, just to continue on the path of multifamily because we were talking about that. And, and they're kind of similar stories in both scenarios. But like the other kind of reason we're seeing a lot of stress in multifamily is we're seeing the, the most amount of new deliveries that we've ever seen in multifamily. Right. And so you think about it takes about, you know, two to three years, sometimes longer to build a apartment complex. And so a lot of these were started when the interest rates were low, the interest uh, or the, the rental rates were increasing these massive double digit, you know, rates. And so everyone's jumping in, do new development because we all know we have a housing shortage. Right. That's it, it, just kind of now become assumed. And that is true. But what's happened is. Uh, the deliveries, they're all kind of took a while to, to build. Now they're they are done and they're starting to hit the market. And so it's adding a significant amount of pressure from a new supply standpoint in a lot of markets. And so it's it's concentrated in certain markets, definitely the Sunbelt markets um, where they've had the most supply. And, and a lot of these big developers were following kind of net migration trends. So it's not every market, but a lot of markets have a massive amount of new supply. And if you look at this this new market report that I referenced again, they have some of this data, and it's it's not just like you know ten percent more than the last year. the The next like two to three years of new apartment deliveries is something to the tune of sixty percent more product than the next highest ever, which was actually the past couple of years. And so it's a massive amount of new deliveries. But to your point. We're, we're, we're seeing this massive kind of supply uh, glut hitting the market. It's going to take some time to be absorbed because demand's a little bit slower right now. But long term, 
all the new construction starts have stopped, meaning all the new projects that are going to be being built for three years down the road from now, those aren't making sense, right? Because construction financing is very expensive. Um, developers are kind of nervous and they don't want to take those risks right now. And so I think we're going to be honestly back in the same boat a couple of years from now where we've absorbed all the supply and we're, we still have a huge shortage uh, for housing. Let's multifamily. Single family is a little bit different to where we haven't had the same amount of new supply hit. And you made the comment earlier, a lot of these people are sitting, uh, these homeowners are sitting on very low interest rate, fixed rate, long-term debt. And I forget the exact numbers, but I think it's the amount of uh, mortgages that are under 5% interest rate is something like 65 or 70% of all mortgages uh, that are currently held right now. That's a, that's a huge number. And so it's causing a lot of people to um, not sell, not move on if they don't have to, to the next, the next house and just hold on to the property. And so it's actually pulling supply out of the market and uh, continuing to create a lot of um, uh, bidding wars on properties. And it's, I think it's slowed down a little bit from what it was kind of in the COVID, right after COVID era. But we're, we're in the same boat there. And it's, I, again, you know, there, there is new construction happening, but it's happening at a slower rate. Um, and it's, it's also happening at the higher end of the market, right? Because developers have all these fixed costs they have to, to, uh, to meet. So, you know, we still have a huge issue in just housing in general, having enough units being, uh, being built. But also in the more affordable segment of the market, we're just not having enough. That's where the, the bigger issue is, is kind of on the lower end of, of that range. So it's in the short term, especially in multifamily, we think there's, there's going to be some continued challenges, right? Because all the forces of real estate nature are working against you, right? With the new supply, creating competition, higher operating expenses, more expensive debt. But the long-term trend is still very, very positive. And so that, that kind of leads to one of the main areas we're focusing on this year, which is um, shifting down the capital stack and uh, shifting towards private credit, right? So we can uh, lend and invest with capital injections into properties that we really believe the business plan, they're in a good location, you know, they're good operators, you know, beautiful property, but they just have a cash flow gap, whether it's Things are a little bit slower than expected, so they need to bolster up reserves. Um, they need to finish the business plan of renovations. And it's, one, really difficult to get more debt that makes sense right now because it's really expensive. And two, it's really difficult to raise equity on follow-on projects because investors are scared. And so we can come in with you know capital that is, um, you know, can come in at a lower part of the capital stack. You get priority interest. You can charge pretty attractive um, interest rates. And uh, reduce your risk because you're, you know, the the first to get paid out after the the senior lender. So that's really where we're kind of fo focusing on over the next couple of years. I think we'll get from a risk adjusted return standpoint rewarded in the market for for providing that type of capital. Let's talk a little bit about recourse versus non recourse debt. I've heard you talk about you guys have uh, some recourse debt. A lot of the stuff I've heard over the past few years, you always want to be non-recourse. Uh, talk about some of the pluses and negatives that in your experience have come about uh, in recourse versus non-recourse debt. Yeah. Yeah. Great, great question. Um, yeah. I used to be a banker, a commercial banker, and that was my language, right? I mean, I, I know debt very, very well. In, you know, kind of for better or for worse, you know, call it, there's definitely an element of luck in all of this, right? Because <laughs> We can't always be make perfect uh, decisions, but sometimes you get lucky and you can call it skill. We, in our portfolio, used almost exclusively recourse debt. And the reason I did that is, one, I just, that's kind of what I knew. I liked, I liked kind of more relationship type banking, working with lenders that I, I could go have a drink with because um, I know having a good lender is so important in any, in any project. And um having them be flexible working with you is really, really important. I don't want someone out of New York that's has no attachment to the market or the community or whatever. And then the other thing is I could get fixed rate debt with a uh, five-year plus terms. And at that point, very, very low, low rate debt. Now the trade-off I'm doing for that is I'm signing a personal guarantee. 
right? But my perspective is if I'm not willing to put my name on the the loan docs, um, then I might, I should maybe not be doing the project, honestly, right? And sometimes it's a little bit scary. And I, I understand the appeal of, of non-recourse lending because I have a lot of, of non-recourse as well, but it, it has to be the right scenarios. And that also provides a lot of confidence when raising capital that my investors know that my balance sheet is on the line if this doesn't go well. So there's a lot of additional alignment of interest. Now, I will say there's, there's, there's certain times that are better for a recourse versus non-recourse. So we do a lot of development work, a lot of new construction, mostly in industrial. And it's pretty difficult to get non-recourse lending in that space because if you, if you try and go after that, one, it's going to be super low leverage, meaning they're not going to lend you a whole lot. And uh, two, it's going to be very, very expensive. I mean, your interest rates are going to be very, very high. Um, so generally the best case the, to, in that scenario is to go after recourse debt. But once you stabilize a project, it makes sense to go non-recourse because you can get more attractive terms from non-recourse lenders that will give you more stabilized values. You can a lot of times take cash at the table, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, non-recourse, I think, was used a lot, and you kind of said that was kind of the MO for several years with a lot of syndicators and capital raisers, and it made it made sense because right? it was attractive with not having to put my own balance sheet on the line. Um, a lot of times, they would go very high leverage, right? They would go like 80% on purchase and maybe 100% of the renovation budget if you're going to value-add project. So you get you know 85% leverage, which means I have to raise a lot less equity. That can be pretty attractive, especially if I'm a new syndicator trying to, trying to raise more equity. And the only real trade-off when you were doing that was, you know, one, you have maybe a little higher fees, but um, you, know, you generally had a uh, floating rate interest rate, right? And you could maybe could potentially have bought a, a swap or some type of fixed rate product, but that was pretty uncommon. And at that point, most people didn't think interest rates were going to go up, you know, 500 basis points in the course of a year. And, and uh, so that, that's one of those black swan things that you just, you know, chalk up to being unlucky if you, if you chose that. But it's also, I think, structurally creates more risk when, one, you're that highly leveraged and you don't have any interest rate uh, hedging in place, right? I think it's always good to have hedging on that. Um, and then the other kind of piece of it too is shorter maturities. So a lot of these times these are three-year maturities and they'll have extensions, but those are expensive and um, no guarantees that they're going to extend anyway. So there's just extra risks going uh, into a non-recourse deal um, with kind of a bridge lender. So these are non-bank lenders. Now there is non-recourse agency debt. And so we do, we have a lot of non-recourse agency debt, uh, both that we've assumed and then that we've kind of refinanced into. And that's a much more conservative structure generally because these are these are governed by your debt service coverage in place right now. So you can't go get a loan on a pro, on a projection which you can do in bridge debt. Where if you're going to go do a value add, you know here's my pro forma that I think I can hit, and they're lending against that. The agencies are going to lend against actual. It's called in place cash flow. In place meaning I can prove it historically. That's what I've actually generated, not what I expect to generate. So it's usually lower leverage, um, and a lot of times you can do a fixed rate product, and it's not recourse. So there's kind of those are the three big buckets I would say of debt. You have your traditional bank debt, um, you have your non-bank bridge lenders, and you have you know agency type lenders, and then you have like life insurance companies and others that are somewhat similar to more the agency route. But th that's kind of the pros and cons of both sides. Excellent. Let's pivot and talk about some other asset classes. Tell us about kind of the, the big picture of industrial right now in this current environment and maybe some of the differences between industrial and multifamily. Yeah. So industrial is you know, similar in a lot of ways and different in a lot of ways. Um, it's you know, the, the big drivers of industrial are a growing economy and a lot of times a growing um, service-based and or manufacturing economy. And so, you know, with multifamily, it's the housing is the driver. People need houses and places to live. That's driving demand for multifamily. For industrial, it's a different set of drivers. And so what has driven industrial being such a great asset class for the past several decades 
largely has been e-commerce, right? So the e-commerce boom, the Amazon, you know, taking over every industry and creating these big distribution warehouses um, has driven a lot of growth in industrial as that has become kind of a big core part of our economy. Well, you know, that's starting to plateau. The e-commerce penetration rate, which is kind of the percent of e-commerce relative to total retail sales has slowed down. So it's not going to go away, right? I think it's still going to continue to grow, but not at the same rate it has. And so a lot of people think, oh, industrial boom is over. Um, but we really think it's the beginning of what we kind of think of phase 2.0 of industrial that's really being driven by something totally different. And it's, it's coming from the, uh, the risks that were exposed in the COVID era, right, of the supply chain issues. That was a refrain that became almost laughable during COVID because everyone's, well, we don't have this because of supply chain issues. Oh, supply chain issues, right? That was um, something that everyone was experiencing. And what happened was over the past several decades, as a globe and as an economy, we have globalized to a, a such a degree that we become interdependent on other economies, other political systems, uh, to a way that we didn't really realize. And so in my perspective, we, we kind of over-globalized in a lot of um, uh, ways because we underpriced the risks of um, things that we couldn't really predict in the black swan event like we saw in COVID. And so because we've now seen what happens where now we're dependent on you know, Taiwan or China to send us these computer chips that, you know, Ford needs to finish their F-150s and they have everything built in this truck except for, you know, this small little computer chip that they can't get. And at one point they had billions of dollars of inventory sitting in, on lots that they could not sell because they didn't have this one little piece of a critical component. And that's one case across the board that happened everywhere. And so what's happening is a lot of these companies are deciding to bring a lot of manufacturing um, of different parts of the supply chain back to the U.S. Um, for a whole host of reasons outside of just, just COVID. But, you know, it's actually pretty competitive relative to China and other markets um, to bring back certain manufacturing back to the U.S. And then also reshoring of inventory. So, you know, a lot of companies are deciding that we should have more inventory in stock versus just in time inventory which was kind of the you know the globalized globalized version of have it ready right when you need it um, but if you can't get it when you need it then it doesn't help so having certain critical components like these computer chips in a in a place that you have more control over in the supply chain so that is driving a lot of of new demand here uh, we're seeing it kind of across the board in certain markets and uh, so we're very very bullish on industrial um, at a kind of supply and demand level, you know, it has a similar story to um, uh, multifamily in that there is a lot of supply that's hitting the market. So we're seeing a, a slight tick up in, in vacancy, but a slight tick up is like ticking up to like four or 5% across the board from like two to 3%. So it's not huge. And the thing about industrial is it's a much shorter time frame to develop. So it takes about you know nine to twelve months to to build a uh, you know warehouse, and so we're seeing that um, that cycle happen a lot faster. So we expect the absorption to to happen a lot faster, and um, then we're kind of back in a similar deal where we have a supply shortage of uh, of need for for more industrial projects. Let's talk about energy now. So as mentioned prior to hidden record, I work at a nuclear power plant. California had their initiative to reach a uh, renewable energy goal by 2030, realized they weren't going to reach that, and decided to keep the nuclear power plant open, clean energy. I think that's generally a good indicator of the, the, the U.S. as a whole. We have these goals, maybe not super realistic. Uh, there's also a lot of uh, turmoil globally. We've got the, the Red Sea crisis right now. We've got this, uh, this conflict in Israel. Iranian proxies causing havoc with the shipping lanes. Tell us a little bit about investing in oil, why you like it right now, and uh, just kind of paint the picture. Yeah, you know, it's a it's a very different asset class for investors that may have not invested in it before because it's just it's it's different than real estate, right? And 
So there's things you got to understand about investing in it. There's a lot of different ways to invest in oil and gas. And so I'm not going to get into all of that because that's a, that's a whole other long conversation. But at a high level, you know, if we're talking macro again, why is it interesting? And, and why we've been paying attention to this for a while. And it's really driven our, our thesis for why we're investing in this asset class. The, the real like simple answer is, we just don't have enough fossil fuels um, that we are producing as a globe that we need to meet demand over the long term. That, that's just as simple as it is. And it's being driven by a few things. One, as you mentioned, we have all these ESG standards that are kind of being pushed from the top down on the you know, political side of things to, to meet certain criteria for renewable energy. Well, I'm all for renewable energy. I, I think we need to continue to make big strides in those areas because it's, it's very important. But the challenge is the, uh, the standards and the timeframes that have been set forth are completely unrealistic. We, we, we don't have, it doesn't produce the, the level of energy need anywhere close to what we need. And it's not going to in the next couple of decades. Uh, we don't have the ability to produce enough technology. We don't. We literally don't mine enough uh, minerals to actually hit the standards that they need to hit. And meanwhile, in the U.S., we're not permitting any more mines to go mine more lithium or other, you know, uh, types of uh, minerals that we need to produce battery technology and other types of renewable technology. And so there's this kind of big mismatch of stated goals and an actual path to get there. And so by most measurements, by most third-party agencies, even if they're very politically left-leaning and are very, promo very much promoting the uh, renewable energy, they're even saying that, you know, we're going to probably still need a lot of fossil fuels over the next decade or two, <laughs> right? And they're using the low end of, of the estimates, but we're projected to at least need the same amount of fossil fuels um, in, over the next decade and probably a lot more than we have right now because of population growth. And um, meanwhile, the other side of this, because of this, this narrative that's being kind of pushed down and a lot of these requirements that are being put on capital allocators to invest in energy, they're getting penalized a lot of times for investing in fossil fuels because it's become a dirty word. And so what's happened is a lot of the capital markets have left that's have left investing into new production. If you think about fossil fuels, it's very different than real estate where, you know, real estate's a naturally appreciating asset, right? It, it naturally grows in value over time with inflation. Well, fossil fuels are different. There's a fixed amount in the ground. And as you pull some out, you deplete the remaining resource left in the ground. That's called depletion. And every year, we deplete about 5% of total production every year just by nature of, of uh, producing the oil and gas. And so by nature, we have to continue drilling more oil, more gas to just even maintain production. But we've seen about a 50% drop in new capital investment um, in this space over the past about eight or nine years. And uh, that kind of uh, foreshadows what the future supply will look like, right? Because it's a lagging indicator, new production, because it takes several years to put um, new wells online. And so what we're kind of seeing at a really high level is declining production over time because it's not a flip the switch type of thing. We can just turn on more production um, when we need it. It's, it takes many years to develop these. And uh, at the same time, we have you know the same or increasing levels of demand. So just to sum it all up, JP Morgan just put out a report uh, a few months ago. Um, and it's not wildly unrealistic. Like, this is not some kind of conspiracy theory or some, you know, this is JP Morgan, right? Investment bank, huge investment bank. They're estimating just if things don't change from right now, that in 10 years, we will have a 7 million barrel per day shortfall globally of fossil fuels. 7 million barrels per day. That is a huge, huge number, and there's no easy way to fix it. And so that's kind of where we're heading um, unless we, we rapidly change things. So we're investing in producing assets. We're, we're buying um, you know, existing producing wells, and then we're also doing some drilling on top of that. And um, 
it's a great time to be buying right now because all these these big allocators have left the space, and you know the 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 deals work really well at today's prices, and they'll, they'll work a lot better if prices go up, um, which we think they probably will over the next uh, decade. So you you guys at Aspen Funds, you invest in multiple asset classes. So a lot of people talk about laser focus being uh, specializing in one specific niche. How do you guys go about gaining a strong enough understanding of these separate asset classes and remaining uh, focused on everything all at once? What's your process like for learning about the new asset classes? Yeah, you know, there, there, there's merits to both um, to both approaches, and there is merits to being laser focused. Um, and the reality is we actually are pretty laser focused. I, I've shared pretty much the main things we're doing, right? It's not, not 10 different things. It's about three, maybe four different things. But we build expertise around each vertical, right? And so um, we're not... Uh, one of the challenges that I think a lot of people get into because I think you can take the level of vertical integration, laser focus to an extreme because every asset class is cyclical. Right, we all intuitively understand every asset class. There's good times to be in it, and there's not as good times to be in it. And if that's the case, then I make the contention that timing is actually a bigger driver of outperformance or return than actual vertical integration and being able to, you know, save say ten percent because you can bring property management in house or construction in house. And not to say you don't do those things, but if you're missing the the tide, right? Then it doesn't really matter if you're in a declining vertical. It doesn't matter how much money you save if it's not a good place to be. And so that's really our thesis. But you know, to your question, you know, we do a lot of research. We look at a lot of different verticals, and we've narrowed it down to a to a handful that we think are the best risk adjusted places to, to to invest in. And then we go build expertise by either hiring and bringing on talent that has expertise in those areas. Um, or we partner with people that have long track records in those areas and create partnerships and teams to go build out the strategy. So, um, you know, it's, it's kind of a combination of both where you, you got to pay attention to the big picture and then you got to build and execute with the right team in place. And so it is, it's a balance, but uh, again, we think the, the bigger driver of return over time is, is being in the right, uh, being in the right tides. Yeah, I love that approach, and I think that's a, an approach that we should all take as passive investors specifically. You know, do your research, but partner, build relationship with experts who are uh, strongly positioned to to do well in those asset classes. Uh, what what's an area that, uh, in your opinion, people should be extremely skeptical about right now, if anything? Oh man, um, <laughs> well, there's, there's a lot of things I think, and it. Here's here's my approach is if you don't understand it, you absolutely should not be investing in it. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a Ponzi scheme or it's not a good deal, but you need to stick to things that you understand that you can explain to like a fifth grader, right? And and it's, I think, a simple idi uh, idiom, but I think Warren Buffett is one that said, invest in what you know, right? And I think it's as simple as that sometimes where I see a lot of people they go and chase shiny objects because, oh, I heard about this guy's investing in this thing and you know they're going to make these crazy returns. And you ask them like, what, well, what actually is it? Well, I don't really know, but it's, you know, this guy's doing it and he knows his stuff. And I mean, as an example, there is a, a big syndication that was kind of going through a lot of these passive investor circles just last year. Um, the guy ended up raising over, I think, $250 million from investors. And it's still allegations, so I can't say it 100% is a positive scheme, but it definitely appears to be that way. And he had created some new technology that was going to, you know, capture all this carbon and, you know, it's it had a great story, but it wasn't real, right? And, and, and a lot of people lost a lot of money uh, because they didn't, they didn't know, any, they weren't asking like the basic questions that you would normally ask because they got caught up in the, um, the potential and the the sexy it factor or whatever. And so it's just having um, having discipline as a passive investor can sometimes be difficult, but sticking to what you know, sticking to your lanes 
and being able to identify what are the kind of key things. What are my, what are my goals first as an investor? Does this align with my goals? And does this actually make sense, right? And if it is one of those really risky things, I'm saying don't, don't do them, but you shouldn't put 50% of your portfolio into that. And I know some people that put huge numbers into this, in this deal because they were so like, this thing could you know, make me a bazillionaire. It's like, if you want to play that, it's, it's a gamble at that point and maybe put, you know, 2% of your portfolio into it and, and, and take that. But it's just people don't, don't have that approach of what's, what are my goals? How do I be disciplined? How do I create actual allocations that make sense with the risk level I'm taking? It's funny you mentioned the carbon capture thing. I saw that come into my inbox and kind of followed along. Never had any interest in it at the time, but ended up talking to a, a fund manager who was raising for that. They raised some capital, found out at the last minute that it was not what they thought it was and ended up <laughs> returning all the money, luckily, wow. to their investors. Yeah, well, Good for them. Good for them. Yeah. Uh, so you host the Invest Like a Billionaire podcast. What are a couple of top lessons, takeaways that you've uh, gained from that podcast? Yeah, it's uh, you know, probably similar to you, just educating on passive investments, alternative investments. What does it mean to invest like the ultra wealthy? And you know, kind of the whole theme of our show was really centered around replicating a lot of what the ultra wealthy have been doing for a long time that most what I call everyday millionaires haven't been doing, but probably should be doing, right? And that, and that the biggest the biggest difference is they're investing a lot into these kind of private alternatives. They're taking a more portfolio approach. They're being smart about their taxes. They're looking for ways to continue to build legacy wealth and think super long term, right? They're thinking not just, um, like you said, that two to five year period. They're thinking a 10 year period, a 20 year period, a 200 year period, right? How do I make this grow and sustain for hundreds of years? Like that's, that's a whole mindset shift that I'm still processing, right? Then how do you think that way? And so, they, they think long term, they think differently, they don't follow the herd, and um, they educate themselves, right? And I think to me, it's so important to make sure you do the education before you write that check. And you don't have to be an expert and know how to do it yourself, but you need to know enough to understand what is the deal you're investing in, what are the key risks, how have those been mitigated, and you know, take measured uh, bets. Tell us a little bit more about Aspen Funds and where people can go to learn more information, potentially interested in participating in uh, some deals with you guys. Yeah, you, know, you can check out the podcast. That's a great way to engage, uh, thebillionairepodcast.com. Or you can check out our private equity fund uh, website, aspenfunds.us. Excellent. All right, ladies and gentlemen, Ben Frazier, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks, John. It was fun.